Uh, I'm not a native Ozarker. I moved down here almost six years ago now. Uh, and I, was not a, I wasn't into local history until I got down here, but I started to, to get learned up, as we say in the Ozarks, about local history. And quickly, Woodruff got on my radar. Uh, I found out that the Springfield was the birthplace of Route 66. And I started reading up. And uh, then I got kind of angry, because when I was a read, book about, read books about Route 66, Avery, who's justifiably known as the father of Route 66, was mentioned. You know, you look in the index, and here's 50 pages referencing Avery. If Woodruff got any mention at all, it'd be like once or twice in the course of a book about Route 66. And I knew he was heavily involved in the birth and, and growth development of Route 66. He served as the first president of the Route 66, uh, the U.S. 66 Highway Association, served two terms as the first president. So I knew he had a role, and I just thought I would write a book about Woodruff to kind of resurrect his role in Route 66. And then I got looking into his life, and this imagined 10-page article turned into a 250-page book because he was so involved. So it was really his relationship with Route 66 and Good Roads Movement that got me interested in him. That's what I thought Woodruff was about, but he was about so many things that it, it grew into a book. John T. Woodruff was an Ozarker, very proud Ozarker, born and raised in the Ozarks, uh, but he went on to become really one of the most influential developers in Springfield and the Ozarks. He just was uh, very involved in all kinds of projects that uh, really developed, made Springfield what it is today. The Civil War was hard on this region, very hard on this region. It divided families, uh, a lot of deaths and destruction. So it was, a, it was a real cataclysmic event for this region. And he grew up, he was born in 1868, so he grew up in sort of the aftermath of the Civil War, and uh, he, he commented late in life that he saw the kind of destruction that war could do, and he wanted to build back up the region. He started off as an attorney. He was pretty much self-taught, um, grew up in poverty in the Ozarks, but uh, clerked with a, a, an attorney in Crawford County, um, and then he got a job being an attorney for the Frisco Railroad, or the... St. Louis to Fran San Francisco Railroad, but most people around here call it the Frisco. Um, and he rose through the ranks and did a lot of uh, legal work for the railroad. And then in 1904, he was relocated to Springfield from St. Louis. Uh, his first wife had died of tuberculosis, so he had a young daughter. He remarried, had a young daughter from his first marriage. So the new family relocated to Springfield. And in 1904, he was 36 years old, born in 1868. So he wasn't a young, young man, 36 years old, and for 40 years he just went on this amazing round of activities that led to all kinds of things, schools, hospitals. He was in the buggy that was, had the site selection team for what was known then as the Fourth Normal School of Missouri. It is now known as Missouri State University. Um, he built hotels, he brought hospitals to the region. One thing that he did that um, was often forgotten is that he brought the Frisco West Maintenance and Repair Shops here, which sounds like, well, so what? They brought a machine shop here. It was a huge complex, and it brought a lot of good paying jobs to Springfield for decades after that. And he was the guy who made it happen because he was an attorney for the Frisco Railroad. He knew they were looking for a new uh, site to add to there as the railroad grew and expanded. and so. If that were the only thing that John Woodruff ever did in his life, he should be remembered as one of the founding fathers of Springfield. Well, Woodruff was very involved in Route 66 and really in good roads in general. And it was a really an over a decade long uh, effort. So um, it began with, there was no federal involvement, there was no state involvement in road building. It was a private endeavor and often communities would just get together to build roads and they would try to raise the funds. Um, and then um, in, the, in the teens, um, uh, highway associations developed, private organizations, uh, dues-paying members would pay dues and, and work to uh, make sure that roads were, were going to be built and were routed through their towns, because they realized that um, the number of automobiles was increasing rapidly and the demand for good roads was very strong. I can't think of anything today that it was across all socioeconomic ranges. Everybody wanted good roads. They'd have good roads rallies. 
There was one in Marshfield in the teens. Marshfield had a population of about 1,000 people at that time. They had like 5,000 people come in for a day-long rally for good roads and speeches and politicians and bands and, and this just went on for, for a, over a decade. And then finally, the federal government, the states, the states started to build, uh, to form highway um, uh, commissions and, and departments. Um, and then the federal government about 1924, 25 realized that they needed to step up and that the associations, the private associations weren't going to lead to a national grid of, of good roads. And so the federal government started to step in and they did something as they are wont to do. They kind of rethought the whole thing and most all roads before then were known as the Ozarks Trail or the Lincoln Highway or they decided to have a numbering scheme and that they'd have these zero number roads going from the Atlantic to the Pacific, East Coast to West Coast. Well, Woodruff wasn't on the commission that chose the numbering, that devised the numbering schemes, but a couple other people that were heavily involved in good roads moving to the Ozarks. One guy was a guy named Cyrus Avery out of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and another guy was a, a man named B.H. Peepmeyer. He was uh, the chief engineer of the Missouri Highway Department at that time. It just so happened that Peepmeyer, Woodruff, and Avery were all going to happen to be in town in Springfield in late April. There was no big plans. This was not a big, you know, promontory point, putting a spike, golden spike in the last tie of the transcontinent. There was, this was not a big meeting. They just happened to be in town and they got together. Uh, they just happened to meet that afternoon and who knows what happened in that meeting, but uh, at the end of the day, they got looking at what available numbers were left. And there weren't many left, but they noticed that 66 was still available. And I don't know what kind of conversation they had about 66, but they ended up sending a telegram late on Friday afternoon, April 30th, 1926 was a Friday, summarizing it says, if everyone else agrees, we would like to propose the number 66 for this proposed road from Chicago to LA. We much, we much prefer it to the number 62. We'd rather have 60, but we prefer 66 to 62. And they sent it off to DC. They didn't hear back from them very immediately. It kind of went on for another month or two, but finally, the federal government did approve 66 as this road from Chicago to LA, swinging through Springfield. So that's why Springfield calls itself, rightly so, the birthplace of 66, because that's the first documented use of that number for this proposed road. I, I've never done a biography, for, biography before, but I've I enjoyed it. Um, and I don't know many other biographers, but I could imagine if you're researching someone's life, you're, you start in because they did something great. And then when you start to look at the day-to-day -day of their lives, and, 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 and you, it's, maybe you lose a little bit of respect for that individual as you learn more about their life. I respect Woodruff more today than when I started in. 